Good morning, everybody. Thank everybody for joining. And uh, my name is Stefano De Paoli. This is uh, the third part of a program of uh, webinars dedicated to startups, uh, in particular dedicated to the opportunities for Italian startups in Hong Kong and in Asia in general, but possibly via Hong Kong. Today, the, the main issue is to present uh, one of our major uh, players in the Hong Kong startup ecosystem. Uh, the name is Betatron. I'm not going to say anything about Betatron because, of course, they will say themselves much better than I can do. Let me go very, very quickly uh, to recap a bit the advantages and, of Hong Kong and why should people go by Hong Kong. Hong Kong, first of all, the strategic location, there is very little to add about it. It's in the center of Asia and the, most, the best connected city in Asia. Hong Kong is China, but it's a separate customs territory. That means goods can enter in and out in really 24 hours, sometimes even quicker. Hong Kong is China, but we speak English. That's a great advantage. For people who have traveled in China, they know how terrible it can be to communicate, how frustrating. Hong Kong is China, but we speak English, right? So communication is vital for businesses. And I have vital differences. Hong Kong is China, but we have freedom of speech, freedom of information. In China, you cannot use Google, you cannot use uh, Facebook, you can use, you cannot use, you cannot read uh, the, the Western newspaper and whatever. In Hong Kong, you can do anything you want. You can speak and say all you want. You can use all the social networks that you're used to use. Uh, Hong Kong is China, but is I cannot say China is not business friendly, but Hong Kong is much more business friendly. Uh, the main issues that I come to my mind, so you know, is you set up a company, a limited company in Hong Kong very quickly without too many problems. And there's no licenses required for most activities. Minimum capital is $1. Um, you know, China can be usually no less than 1 million RMB. Hong Kong is $1. Immigration is not complicated at all, we help uh, getting through the immigration problem and, uh, and, uh, and incubation and, and, uh, and co-working facilities available make uh, uh, possible startup not too expensive, let's say. Another important issue is the free movement of capital. You can get in and out any amount of capital in any currency. Hong Kong dollar is convertible. We don't have the renminbi. We have the Hong Kong dollar, which is a fully convertible uh, currency. Tax system is a, one of the most important issues. Just 8.25% on the first 2 million Hong Kong dollar of profits. And 16.5 uh, on the rest. We don't have VAT, we don't have anything else. Um, I am going very, very quickly. Anybody who is interested in expanding more, please get in touch with us, okay? You can get in touch with Betatron, but we can, you can always get in touch with us for any details regarding Hong Kong, expanding your activity in Asia. And uh, I leave it there, I pass the floor. I, we have two friends, uh, as you can see, who will uh, lead and manage the whole webinar this morning. And they are Michael and Aiden from Betatron. Um, so uh, without any further ado, I will leave the floor to Michael first for please start this presentation and webinar. Thank you, Michael. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and thank you very much to everybody for making the time to uh, join. So I'm going to share my, it's okay for me to share my screen now, right? Sure. Okay. Yeah. okay, can everybody see this okay? Perfect. Okay, great. So um, thanks again um, <clears throat> uh, to Stefano and Ilaria for, for this opportunity. Really, really appreciate it uh, in your efforts. Thank you and for uh, promoting Hong Kong. Go Hong Kong, we love Hong Kong. Uh, and thank you very much for everybody who has uh, made the effort to dial in. Really appreciate your time. You know that being a founder is uh, you know, more than a full-time job. So thank you. Uh, I wanna make this as uh, informative as I can. So I'm not gonna speak for very long, but these slides, um, they contain an introduction on Basetron, but also some additional information, which I'm not gonna go through now. It's for you guys to read afterwards. Um, and it will kind of put into context some of the stuff that we say when we give feedback uh, to the company. So please uh, don't worry about absorbing absolutely everything on the page because you will get these slides at the end. Okay, so going through it. So, um, you know, what is Basitron? Uh, it's a leading early stage venture capital firm accelerator based in Hong Kong. 
Um, we're like a network of networks. So we were founded originally three years ago by six leading VCs and investment companies in Hong Kong. Um, we've accelerated almost 40 companies over five cohorts. Um, our um, founding partners have more than uh, 800, um, US dollar, 800 million US dollars AUM. Some of their investments are quite famous, like La La Move, which is a Hong Kong unicorn, Cupital. Um, we have a very deep network of um, venture capitalists and investors and mentors. Um, we do a lot of kind of outreach events for the uh, ecosystem for free, in addition to the stuff that we do for our cohort. And as a result of that, we've been um, kind of rated quite highly by the uh, local population here which we and, and in Asia, which we really appreciate. Um, our funding amount has increased each cohort, so now we fund up to half a million USD per company, and our applications have also gone up a lot. We've on target to reach two and a half thousand for cohort six. All of this information is on the website as well, so I'm not going to go through it in detail now, but essentially it's a four month program. Um, it is based in Hong Kong, but we only require physical presence for three two week periods the first two weeks, middle two weeks, and then two weeks at the end where we do a roadshow of demo days, one in Hong Kong, one in Singapore, and then uh, two in the West Coast, um, Silicon Valley. So uh, we look at what the company needs top to toe. Um, we work with them on growth and traction. We prepare them for their next round of fundraising, um, and then we take them through to the global roadshow. There's also a lot of hands-on help uh, that's very customized to each uh, company. Um, a bit about our startup selection process. Um, there are five stages, um, online application, pitches in person, due diligence, interviews, and then selection. Uh, we're looking for obviously very strong teams that have a reason for applying to us and to going to um, Asia. They have a scalable business model um, with a large market size with potentially large you know, uh, venture returns for us. Um, and again, to summarize, it's a 500K USD investment, four month program from July to November with a global demo day roadshow. Um, the applications, <clears throat> uh, the application period uh, formally closed last week, but we still can take um, applications now and we'll try and go through them as much as we can. Um, so I think that is about it. So the rest of these things which I've put on here is things that you should go for uh, you should kind of read in detail afterwards, right? But the one thing is, you know, VC is not the only option. We're going to talk to you and give you feedback on what we look at when we look at your um, pitches. But, you know, just be aware of the fact that uh, VC money is not the only option. And actually for some companies at certain stages, it's not the best one. So please take the time to look at all the other funding options you have. And then at the end of this um, presentation, uh, we have a section on like fundraising materials and how to improve them. So you, I'm not going to go through that now, but um, if we've got time at the end, I will. Otherwise, I'll send it to you guys and um, you can read it at your own time. Okay, so now we gonna move, we're going to move on to um, the pictures, right? Yeah. So while we're setting up the pitches, you know, I just wanted to give an, a, a quick introduction, you know, why we're doing it in this format. We thought it'd be best to get these startups to actually pitch so that we can give in a VC perspective and overview of what, you know, how we evaluate and what we look for in companies, as well as provide, you know, feedback on the spot for not only the companies presenting, but also for the audience to actually take and improve on their own pitch decks or their own pitches as well. Okay, so feel free to ask any questions which we will address towards the end of the session. And just a reminder, once again, um, please, please do keep your presentations to strictly four minutes, as you've been told by email. I actually will timer you and I will cut you off if you go above four minutes. So please, for the benefit of everybody in the group, finish at four minutes, otherwise I'll just dive in and cut you off. We want to have time to ask you questions and give you a chance to reply to them and then give you some feedback. And we want everyone who's signed up to have an equal time. So please stick to that. Okay, great. Hello, uh, hello everyone. So glad to yeah. be here today. You have slides? Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Just a second. Uh, mm, okay. Okay, you should be able to see. Yeah, if you want to just now. Yeah, if you want to just maximize it. 
Yes, can you see it uh, full screen now? Yeah, so uh, whenever you're ready, please begin. I'm gonna start the timer and the bell will ring after four minutes. So please keep to the time, okay? Okay, I'm ready. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Marco Filippi, CEO and founder of Volvero, and we enable democracy of drivers. Uh, fewer vehicles, but for everybody. So the perfect storm in uh, transportation industry is here. Indeed, uh, COVID-19, it's like the, just the final step of a huge amount of issue that uh, was uh, showing uh, up in uh, the recent year. And in particular, there is a high underutilization of vehicles. So think uh, about the fact that for the 96% of the time, vehicles remain idle and uh, usually um, the trend in uh, uh, vehicle sales is uh, already uh, shrinking and uh, with the COVID-19, it will uh, shrink even more. So in fact, in the future, 30% of less vehicles will be sold in the coming years. And this is also because it's part of the trend. Millennials are not buying cars anymore. And on top of these, all these amount of vehicles remain there and waste the urban areas in the cities. So everything is happening while millions of people everywhere, all over the world, every day, are suffering in find the, the optimal solution for their mobility needs. Indeed, uh, there are several non-optimal solutions. For instance, car rental, car sharing, and public transport uh, are just limited because uh, or they are too expensive or they are not adaptable to uh, the uh, user's need. So the solution is Volvero and up in a 200 billion market that enables dealers and owners of car to share them with a community of driver using the most innovative technologies for checking how users are driving someone else's vehicles and also the condition of the vehicles themselves. So uh, for users, it's really easy to uh, upload their own vehicle. That can be a car, a motorcycle, a commercial vehicle, for instance. Uh, and for uh, drivers, it's very easy to scroll the list and to find the optimal vehicle they, they need for their day. So why now? There are several trends that uh, are happening. We already discussed about COVID-19. There is a vertical drop in the usage of public transport. And uh, also there are several environmental issues. Uh, and uh, there is already a trend in the race of uh, a shared economies uh, platform like Airbnb, TaskRabbit, uh, and uh, Uber, for instance. But also because now uh, car dealers are not able to sell car anymore and they are uh, looking for innovative solution for making money out of their business so we can easily leverage uh, their stock of vehicles and also technology. Recently, uh, certain technology uh, innovation happened. So there is a bit of competition in the market, but we are different because first of all, we provide a unique insurance policy that leverages smart contract and uh, covers uh, users and drivers. And also because the technology we use, we track how drivers are driving based on their uh, mobile phone sensors. And uh, there is an artificial intelligence algorithm that analyzes this data and revert back feedback. We started uh, the business uh, one and a half year ago. We did uh, uh, several uh, uh, programs, acceleration program, but we are now in the process of raising. Um, so <laughs> we need uh, 1.2 million uh, for uh, scaling the business. We already did a seed round in Italy, uh, uh, a test round in Italy. And also we expect uh, to create uh, um, synergies with the Betatron founders. So ladies and gentlemen, I am Marco Filippi, CEO founder of Volvero. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Marco. I really appreciate it. Yeah. So I guess the first thing that I want to understand in, is in terms of like the user journey, right? So, you know, you're um, getting this stock from users' cars, right? You're not buying cars, you're not providing them. Um, it's users' cars and then other people can use them, right? Because you, you mentioned you that you're the Airbnb of driving. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so then we connect owners and yeah, drivers. 
Got it, got it. So from a practical standpoint, okay, let's say I own a car, yeah? And I put it on the, on the platform. Aiden rents the car and he drives really far away from where I live, but he's only doing it one way because then he wants to get a train back or he wants to get a lift with his friends or whatever. Um, how do you manage that? How do you manage the geographical location of the cars of the users which allow you to use their cars? Yeah, that's a great question, Michael. And uh, uh, that depends on who the owner of the vehicle is, because if it's like a car rental or a car dealer, uh, it happened in Italy, for instance, that uh, uh, these uh, owners allow you to take uh, the car from one place and uh, left it in another place, in another shop of the same car dealer, a chain for instance or in another shop of the same car rental if the owner is a private owner it's likely that uh, he or she wants you to bring back the vehicle to the initial point but that's uh, free for uh, uh, the users and uh, this is also a uh, sort of uh, upselling that we can do in the future like providing the service uh, uh, that someone is bringing back your car and uh, you as a driver uh, will have to pay more for uh, for sure uh, having the chance to leave the car somewhere else it's something in the pipeline for the uh, have you studied the... um have you studied how that's been done before because people have tried that before with um bikes for example and failed spectacularly and people have tried that with cars but where the cars are pooled and also it's been very difficult for them to make that sustainable um, have you have you looked at that already the, the models that existed before Yes, yes, sure. We are uh, well aware about what happened in the past. Uh, uh, I have also spent months in the United States uh, studying the competitors. Uh, there are two, Turo and Get Around there. So we know what kind of problem they faced and how they solved the problem or how they didn't solve the problem. So we, uh, we put in place procedure in order to, to prevent this to happen to us. Okay, got it. And then next thing is, um, you know, on your pictures, you show kind of like a country lane, right? But at the moment, are you targeting intercity or intracity? So you're doing inside cities or between cities or both? No, we started uh, mainly with uh, uh, um, with uh, not urban uh, uh, commuting. So we don't want to compete right now with the, the intracity services because uh, that's... Uh, a different, a slightly different business model. So for us, it was even much more difficult to handle. So for us, it's uh, more uh, interesting to target uh, uh, extra city activities. Okay. Do you have a limit on the distance traveled? So for example, can I get a car from Milan and go all the way down to, you know, the very bottom of the very south of Italy? Or is that beyond the, the, the uh, distance allowed? So there is uh, no explicit uh, limit uh, when it comes to where you are allowed to drive. Uh, there is uh, uh, 250 kilometers uh, already comprising the price you paid and uh, then you have to pay for any extra uh, mile or extra kilometer. And also uh, since uh, our insurance policy was done in in partnership with Europe Assistance, a global player in insurance policies, uh, we allow people to go abroad so our policy cover vehicles all over europe and this is a great plus for us because it also allows us to scale faster okay <clears throat> and who pays for the fuel how do you deal with fuel costs <coughs> yeah so when <coughs> uh, when a driver uh enter the car uh, he has to confirm the data reported uh from the owner about the level of uh, fuel in the in the tank and he's on the driver to uh, bring uh, to put the fuel as same as the beginning into the car okay so just just to make sure that i understand so i um decide to book a car i go to the car when i get in um presumably you guys through the app or something have told me this car should have this much fuel i check it and then i say to you yes this is correct or i say no this is incorrect and then yeah. if it's correct I go to my destination, but before I leave it in the, in the final place, I need to make sure that it has the same amount of fuel as when I collected it, correct? Yeah, exactly. What happens if I go to the car and the amount of fuel is incorrect? If you, as a driver, you mean that? 
Yeah, so I, I go there and you guys have said to me, what you yeah. should see is this many liters and I go there and I say there's no fuel or there's very little amount yeah. of fuel. Yeah, yeah. So that way you will request immediately over the app the owner to update the level of the fuel. And uh, if he refuses to do that, you are allowed uh, to just drop the car and not take it. Is uh, as your if you are booking an Airbnb, you enter and uh, there is a different flat, so you are allowed to just drop it, and we will assign a uh, bad feedback to the to the user, to the owner. Okay, got it. Um, that's enough for me from now, Aiden. I think just just very quickly because we're going to be running out of time very soon, and we want Sorry. to provide you some feedback. <laughs> Um, it is an operationally challenging field uh, over here, but ultimately, we, I'd like to know what sort of traction do you have so far from the B2C side of things, but also the B2B side of things? Yeah, so traction is, uh, um, is uh, let's say, uh, of interest for us because we were uh, able to sign an agreement with one of the main car dealers of Europe, and that's why I pushed and stressed this factor in the presentation because now there are a lot of car dealers that are not able to sell cars and they have to buy an increasing number of cars every year because they have agreement with the OEM, the producer. So it's them that are calling us to use the app, you know? And we were able to sign an agreement with one of the main car dealers of Europe. Uh, then we ran a test in uh, November in Italy and it went uh, pretty well. We were supposed to roll out the uh, official version of the app a couple of months ago and then we decided just to freeze it because uh, you know what okay. happened. So. Okay, got it. Um, so, you know, I just want to provide some feedback over here. I, I think the pitch in general was quite good, but what you could add on really is actually these pilot projects or some results that come by that really come and show, um, you know, your, your intended audience that, hey, you know, this isn't just an idea. We've kind of executed on it and also made out the operational process um, a little simpler so that it, it's quite easy to understand. Yeah, Michael, yeah, anything you want to add? I yeah, I agree. Um, well done, Marco. I think it's really hard to do this in four minutes. It's like an evil amount of time. You should get five or six, but we had to make it short. So well done. Um, I think a good thing for you to go, for everyone to do though in general is um, in addition to your slides, right, make sure that you've got quite detailed appendix slides with your deck so that when people ask certain questions, you can anticipate it and say, oh yes, here's a slide about fuel or oh yes, here's more detail about our insurance. It's very, very impressive when we do pitches and people do that where they anticipate that people will probably want to know about you know, one of these 10 things. You can't go through all 10 things in the pitch, obviously, but you're prepared, not only in your answer, but you've made a material when you answer. And what that gives is it kind of confirms to the investor that, oh wow, they really did know this beforehand. They prepared it. They're not just you know, BSing or doing it on the spot. And Marco, in your case, um, I think it's interesting that you're focusing on between cities rather than within cities. I don't know whether I think that's the first, the right one to go through, but for first, but that is a long discussion. Um, I think the insurance bit is an interesting play. Um, I think the thing that a lot of people will be, would be worried about um, is like safety and liability. Um, because obviously with Airbnb, that's a that was a concern when it first started. Whereas with, um, but it's quite difficult to make a house, you know, unsafe for the next person. Whereas with cars, you know, um, you need to make sure that no one's damaged your cars, that people are good drivers, all that kind of stuff. So it's like an extra layer of competition and something that I think you should anticipate people ask you constantly. But um, other than that, well done, good pitch, next. Thank okay, so go you. for it, Diego. Thanks for the feedback. Thank you, you're very welcome. Thank you. And good luck with it. Okay, so are we going to Diego now? Okay. Thanks for inviting me. You're very welcome. Okay, share the screen. Okay, my name is Diego. I'm CEO and co-founder of DRB, Innovative Startup, spin-off of the Politecnico di Milano. Okay, uh, let's imagine you are the owner or, or the operation and management uh, man, uh, maintenance manager of a productive asset, let's say a wind farm. Uh, what are your main goals? Uh, the first one is the optimization of the production uh, return on investment. So you want your plan to be in good shape. 
Then you have uh, minimization of the downtimes due to inspections and maintenance because, uh, and you want to reduce the risk of uh, long lasting repairing. Uh, so to stop for a long time your, your uh, production. And obviously you want to ensure safety to people working in the plant. Uh, Drone Radio Beacon is um, an hardware software platform enabling safe, precise, and autonomous drone services for industrial plants and uh, for infrastructure uh, inspection. And um, for the moment, we are focusing on power lines and wind farm inspections. <coughs> Our goal is to simplify and speed up some of the operations involved in uh, inspection activities. So our solution is based uh, on two pillars. The first one is our patented technology, uh, which runs on the ground station driving the drone. And the other one is uh, our AI software. Uh, we have actually two, uh, one for target, target recognition on board of the drone. And the other is uh, for offline damage classification when we do the report of the inspection. So uh, let's see how it works uh, on an example. We pick the wind farm example. So today there is uh, very little wind, so it's a good day for a blade inspection because uh, there is no production. And um, the manager can pick up the drone and the ground station, set in front of the WTG, the turbine, and uh, start the mission with uh, an app Pasha button, and uh, the mission uh, is uh, the, the a professional inspection is done in 15 minutes. So there is no need for pilots and the results are better. Uh, and the, uh, most of all, the, 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 the inspection is done whenever the clients want. Uh, the inspection is starting according to a standard mission uh, depends on the WTG model, but we have to take into account some variables, like for example, the, the real position of the, of the blades, because we recommend the uh, reverse Y position, but uh, the, the site manager can stop it uh, slightly differently. So we have to take into account this, this kind of things. Uh, so we have uh, a, an AI, like in the picture, uh, that is able to uh, change the mission according to the real uh, path. Uh, once the mission is done, uh, we have a video that we can send to our server where there is the other AI software running offline uh, that is able to extract all the uh, pictures with damages on the blades and classify them. So we can- 30 seconds left, by the way. Sorry? You have 30 seconds left, just to let you know. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so the, the, once the inspection, the, the, the frames are um, picked up, we can make the, the report online, uh, which is fully digital. So you can apply all the um, uh, analytics. Uh, we already have some customers and early adopters. Uh, one is Terna for power lines, and we have air, energy, and freer for the wind farms. The business model is quite simple. We rent all the necessary for the client for the inspection, so they can make their own inspection, and they pay for usage of the platform for the report. Okay, so I think you can just wrap up uh, very quickly, and then we'll go to some questions and answers. Okay, okay uh, that, that should be it already. We okay. have three founders. Uh, I am the CEO, PhD in telecommunication, entrepreneur since 2007, uh, with an MBA from ESCP Europe. Uh, Giuseppe is our CTO, uh, is a certified drone pilot with uh, more than 10 years of entrepreneurship experience. And Luca Reggiani is uh, the, our research leader, is a professor at the Polytechnic. Okay, okay cool. Thank you, Diego. Aiden, do you want to go first for this one? Okay, yeah. So 
I think let me provide some initial feedback first, and then that will address into the questions. You know, uh, thank you for the pitch. You know, uh, the the trouble with four minutes is it's a very technical product over here, and you know you will be you will be pitching in different styles and different formats. Sometimes you'll get twenty minutes, sometimes you'll only get five minutes. So you'll have to adjust the pitch accordingly um, to who you're pitching to. Now, yeah. in light because you only have four minutes, I would come and say you know. Uh, talk about the problem that you're solving and also maybe yeah. the time savings, the actual metrics that come out of that. Uh, you don't have to talk so much about the, the technology. That's, that can come into a follow-up conversation or maybe into the Q&A if someone wanted to dive deeper into that. Because again, you only have four minutes to come and impress. That's what we really want to come by and see like for your clients that you have traction, what are you doing for them? So yeah. this is my question to you now that you know, you've run some pilots, you have some clients, how much revenue have you generated for them? How, and, you know, how much time or, or problems have you solved for them? Okay. Uh, we started uh, making some monies in 2019. Um, we, we, we made uh, 100,000 euros uh, from the wind farms and around 30,000 euros for the power lines. Uh, for the power lines, it was more a research uh, thing. So uh, because it's, we are uh, building a, a new kind of uh, inspection. Got it. So is this a product. fully deployable product <coughs> already? Or even with the wind farm, there's still this is still a pilot and you have to improve a lot more on it? Um, for the wind farm, it's, it's quite finished product. Um, last year, we made all the testing with them. It was a service while testing uh, because there was both the pilot and, and the, 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 uh, the ground station uh, driving the drone. Uh, and this year we we are making the the, the full uh, service okay so so i'm just going to end this by saying that if you went to sell to five other wind farms you would have five hundred thousand dollars in revenue for a, a finished product while you work on the rest of the product correct mm -hmm. okay so but that could be something you know to, to, to take note in terms of commercialization because you want to balance commercialization together with you know r d also at the same time okay, okay. Uh, Michael, you want to provide yeah, any quickly, feedback? Or? Just quickly. Um, uh, so, Diego, thank you very much for your presentation and well done on the, the traction that you've achieved so far. Um, just to echo, just for all of you guys, just remember, tailor to who you're presenting to, not only in terms of the time, but also who it is. If you're, if you're uh, trying to get customers, the pitch should be different to an investor, right? Because a customer or like a supplier or something, yes, they need to know the technical stuff. But for us, we need to know like what you're doing and what the traction is so far. And, and so lead with that first, as Aidan said, right? Like we, we, won't, we, we won't necessarily need to know right at the beginning all of how you achieve the thing. What we wanna know is what was the thing you delivered to the customer? What was the benefit? And also how many times have you done that in your traction? And then we'll be like, okay, cool, we wanna know more. And then you can tell us more. And this is an example of, you know, those appendix slides. So you know, you can keep those slides in, but just miss them, go through, go through them. And then if somebody says, okay, that's great. I'd like to know how are you able to do this quicker, cheaper, whatever. And then you say, okay, I'm glad you asked. Here's the details. Um, but um, other than that, well done. I know it's very hard doing it in four minutes. So keep up okay, good Just work. another question on my side, because, you know, uh, we've heard a lot of drone companies pitch, at, even from an inspection perspective on power lines, um, what's, what's your competitive advantage against them? Because every country seems to have their own company addressing this problem. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, it's the, our patent. Uh, it's an innovative uh, way to drive drones. Uh, it's very precise and very reliable compared to RTK or uh, in GPS, which is mostly used. And also, it can be used if you don't have RTK. Uh, so you, you, in some places where GPS is not uh, present because it's uh, indoor, for example. And um, also the uh, interaction between uh, the software, the AI software, and the localization algorithm is uh, a key point for 
uh, our competitive advantage. Okay, got it. Uh, thank you very much for your pitch. You. you know, thank you, and you know, we'll be we'll be touching it with you. Thanks. 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 The next is Robin. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. okay. Can you Robin. can you see me? Yes. To, yeah, you can see me. Hi. Thanks a lot. Shall I start? Uh, we can't see your screen, so you need to share your screen so we can see your slides. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, share the screen here. Yeah. You see it? Yes, if you could maximize it, that'd be great. Uh, I don't know, this is a PDF. Okay, that's fine, it's fine, just start. Okay, four minutes from now, good luck. Thank you. Very nice to meet you. Thanks for the opportunity to present. Uh, just so short introduction about myself and the team. I'm the CEO of Conexa. My name is Robin Dyna, um, and we are a team of seven very experienced founders. Personally, I'm 45 years old, operating in the insure tech space in Europe since 2007. And I've had the blessing to start my entrepreneurial career with one of the top insure tech founders and CEOs of our times, uh, Yashish Dahia. He was the founder and CEO of U Unicorn Policy Bazaar, the largest insurance comparison site in Asia. Yashish is also a member of the board of advisors of Conexa. Uh, in the call, there is also um, Conexa CEO, uh, Luca Gargiulo, uh, who um, has worked several years in Accenture, Bain and McKinsey in technology and lately in Octo comes to, his late experience comes from Octo Telematics where he was the COO. Octo Telematics is the global telematics leader. I won't present the others or maybe do that in the end if we have some time left. Um, so Conexa uh, has the mission to transform European current, the current insurance market by delivering a digital and telematics first insurance solution offering unprecedented customer centricity and flexibility. As you can read, can read from the slide, Conexa will essentially be the first insurer in Italy and one of the very few globally to issue 100% full telematics policies. It will price customers according to their driving behavior and actual individual risk profiles, thanks to IoT data and artificial intelligent risk assessing algorithms. So disrupting essentially the mutualistic approach to risk pricing Utilizing, utilized by the motor insurance industry at large for several decades. Conexa will also make extensive use of chatbots and artificial intelligence algorithms, utilizing driving data to digitalize the entire user insurance value chain and create an easy, flexible and engaged experience for its customers. Technically, it will be structured as a managing general agency um, partnering with um, a reinsurance company, particularly Conexa is partnered with Swiss Re, who will be the Con Conexa's leading reinsurer in Italy. And Robin, also across uh, sorry, to, uh, sorry to butt in, but I just want you to know that your slide has been, this, <clears throat> it's been the same slide the whole time. Is that what it's supposed to be? For, for now, we... yeah. I'm going to okay. change slide in a, in a second. Okay. Um, so this structure gives Conexa both financial strength and operational agility. I'm going to change slide now. Hold on, let me. Uh, Just checking it wasn't, um, you know, stuck or something. Yeah, yeah, no. It's the four minutes I need to, you know. So uh, Conexa's distribution strategy. Conexa will be the first insurer in Europe with a true multi-channel strategy being distributed online by comparison sites, physically by retail banks, uh, will be um, distributed um, from the outset in over 1,000 bank, bank branches in Italy, and also will be part of innovative long-term car subscriptions. So they're subsidizing car ownership. Um, thanks to its digital value chain, I'm changing slide again. Thanks to its digital value chain and the distribution partnerships that Correcta has already signed, that Connexa has already signed, Connexa will break even in the first 18 months on a 2 million investment uh, and, and then become self sustaining. In other words, it will do the seed round um, and then um, become self sustaining in a plan that will deliver 77 million revenues and 17 million in BIDA in year five, again, based on the existing partnerships. 
connect size uh, seed as the seed pre done. So could you wrap up in 10 seconds please yes um so we're five months away from um go live this is the list of uh, of milestones uh, we have one million of uh, committed capital and we're looking for a half a million to a million from a leading investor to close the round and start in five months okay well done um aiden do you mind if i go first on the phone Okay, great. So uh, let me just drop some some generic feedback over here first. You know, I noticed it's, it's a very long slide. Um, again, reiterate to everybody, you know, it's going to be a four minute pitch, put in the necessary slides inside over there. Um, and also, you know, your, your first slide um, talked about the company, but then you went into greater detail. And that's why slides help. Slides give us a visual representation uh, to connect what you're saying together with maybe either a flow chart, an org chart, or just some pictures to understand even better. So it, it really helps connect uh, there rather than just your narration in that sense itself. So what, what started out as you know an excitement to, to look at, at the company and a perspective, just kind of muddled along to say like, oh, um, I'm, I'm not able to grasp the full understanding of this because of, of the explanation. I would need to go dig in a second time again. So first impression wise uh, could be better. Uh, so secondly on that, um, you know, just wanted to find out more really about, um, there's no traction at the moment as far as I understand, cause you haven't launched. So really the plan to launch and also pre-contracts again, come to be very important to immediately kind of secure that interest. So do you want to go and, um, explain what you set up to be able to launch in five months time? So yes. Uh, and your online application. So yeah. The, I mean, the, the list. The list is on this is on this slide. Uh, just just to summarize, we have um, completely de-risked the um, plan from a, both a cost and revenue perspective. We have basically run RFP for um, our telematic services through the top eight uh, global telematic service providers for the core insurance platform and for the so-called third-party administrators, which are essentially entities that, that handled claims. Uh, those things will purchase um, externally on a platform as a service basis and integrate and develop internally what we um, think of as cutting edge, te cutting edge technologies, our, our artificial intelligence algorithms for pricing, for customer engagement and the things I described at the beginning, as well as our chatbots uh, to both communicate and interact with, um, with our customers. Those will be kind of the, the, the differentiating points and what will help also digitalize the, the value chain. We've signed up also the distribution partnerships. Um, I mentioned as an example, uh, will be um, sold at over a thousand bank branches in Italy at the outset. Um, that's very unusual for a startup even a young startup, let alone a startup that's, that's already live. Obviously, it's a reflection of the experience, my experience and the experience of the rest of the team um, and track record in the market. Um, and so we've signed up that, we've signed up um, aggregators and we are about uh, to sign up another partnership to distribute across um, captive car dealers in the Italian market, like you know, several hundreds of, uh, of car dealers to enter also the automotive market, which, can, which is kind of the third area. I mentioned the long-term car subscription space. Okay, Got it. Um, um, so uh, thank you uh, for presenting. Yeah. I'm sorry? No, no, sorry. I mean, there, there's a number of other things, but you know, it's, the, li the list is very, very long of, Okay. Those are yeah, kind look, of the macro, the macro areas, if you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, Robin, I just want to give you some, we don't have time for questions and feedback, so I'll just give you feedback because I think it will be more useful to you. So all the companies that are presenting today, we've read, uh, we've looked at your decks, we've read your applications beforehand. So we actually have quite a bit of context about you before we've seen you pitch. Um, yep. in, your, in your case, I think your company came across much better on the online application than it did now. And the reason why I think is because um, you know, a lot of these slides that they're very good is in as being slides to be read, but not so good for presentation. For example, um, you know, the one that you have here, <clears throat> we, we asked you about the, you know, traction that you have, because we know you have some, 
Um, and then you said, oh, it's on the slide, but this is almost impossible to read whilst listening to you at the same time. Um, so if you're using slides for presentation, try to maximize them for that. Um, and so that they're just getting the, 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 the key bullet points. And then, you know, I always say to people like pitching in person is kind of like, or, you know, sending a teaser and then a, doing a pitch and then sending something to read. It's like a gradual escalation of, um, of commitment and contact. It's almost like dating, right? So just give um, the most important, most salient things, which I think in your case would be just to say that, you know, you do have these um, things in place for the next five months and briefly go over what they are. You don't have to go through every single step of them. Um, and then also the other thing I'd say is, given that you only have a short amount of time, um, I, I don't know why, but for some reason, um, especially insurance tech and um, kind of fintech, um, a lot of the founders, they talk about their team uh, right at the beginning. I think maybe that's because they want to build credibility about what, the, what their team can do. And I understand the need for that, but try to make it a little bit shorter so that you've got more time to talk about the product itself, what's unique about it and the traction you've got. Um, because, you know, obviously if you've been invited to the pitch, then we already kind of believe in you enough that we want to hear about you. And then we'll find out more about your background uh, later on. Uh, and then it gives you more time to talk about the actual product and what makes it special, if that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you, thank you. No, Michael, the next person is uh, Katerina. Oh, okay. oh, sorry. Okay. Super. Hi, Katerina. Hello. So, okay, so can I start? Yeah, just please remember it's four minutes and we'll yeah, cut you off. Sure. Four minutes. Yes. Good luck. So, I am Caterina Laporta, I am CEO of Complex Data. Why our game is creating value by decoding data. So, we are a spin off of the Center of Complexity by System of the University of Milan. And what we do, we just find simple solution of complex data. We have a complex. A, complex data, we have to find a solution. Uh, these are many of the, you know, the subjects that we are able to solve using um, the very um, new innovative uh, uh, way tools, in particular on biomedical, uh, on biomedical issues. The team, so we are an interdisciplinary team combining a scientist and a business uh, devoted to in innovation. Uh, with different expertise, and I think this is uh, really the strength of our company. Our first platform was Ari is Ariadne. So Ariadne, what is Ariadne? Artificially, we developed a, a tool, um, very innovative, uh, using artificial intelligence for breast cancer, and is the first uh, platform that is able to do a precision medicine approach. The problem, of course, everybody knows is very important. There are millions of people that die for cancer still now. And in particular, breast cancer has a higher mortality, in particular for women. Uh, what, what is our solution? So we use an, innov in, you know, an innovative way. We combine environment and DNA, and we are able with our platform to give a score of aggressiveness for that specific tumor with that specific uh, biological characteristics. So why is useful? Because it provides to oncologists a powerful tool that don't have at the moment to decide a personalized treatment. We validate, of course, we are scientists, so we validate with high journal, high profile journals what we did, and we have now a a patent claim that we filled in 2019, here it is, is wrong. Um, we have all the procedures. Why is, what, what about uh, with respect to our, uh, you know, competitors? We have a very important competitors, but with respect to the others, we are able to give uh, a score, uh, you know, an answer to others kind of uh, segment of uh, breast cancer that are not, uh, they don't have any answer. Uh, since we are in lockdown now in, uh, I mean, sabbatical in Munich, LMU, um, during the lockdown, we thought about COVID-19 and we developed uh, and we changed a little bit our platform for COVID-19. The question for this uh, is uh, to understand why there are some people that are more, uh, you know, uh, severe uh, affected by COVID with respect to the others. And this is our next, uh, you know, platform, our next uh, challenge. So our roadmap, we have the patent, the certification is still started. So they, they, we are ready to be in the market, at least in Europe in the uh, next 24 months. What we're looking now is the seed funding to complete all the procedures and to scale up in particular. Thank you so much. Ready for questions. Wow, thank you. That was very, very, very good. 
Um, and you did that in three minutes. It's incredible, oh, actually. Good. Um, I was not prepared because I received, you know, your invitation just uh, this morning. So I was doing well, other stuff. That's it's even okay. more amazing, then. Well done. That's that's. Oh, really sorry. Cool. I'm not. Uh, I no, no, it's, no, no, it's, it's great. It's good. It means we have more time to ask questions. So if you could just share your slides again, please, Katrina. Sure. Absolutely. Sorry. And um, I just want to say, um, you know, personally, thank you very much for trying to solve this problem. It's a huge problem. Um, I'm actually an ex-medic myself. Okay, uh, so good. I'm unaware of this. And also, I'm going to ask a, a few technical questions, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, so feel free to go quite deep with the science if you need to. Uh, okay. So I guess... Um, <clears throat> Originally, when I read your online application, I, I, what, what you're doing is, is kind of um, more than what I originally thought you were trying to do. So is the, is the aim here that you're trying to basically eliminate, you know, false positives or are you going beyond that and just being core to the original diagnostic process? Yeah, of course, this is one of the reasons, of course, false positive, but even more. So most of the patients are overtreated, as you well known, because yeah. since the doctor doesn't know what to do, many times what happens that they're just treated, no? Because if you don't know what to do and uh, there is any subject, so speak, suspect that uh, could be worse, uh, you treat. And uh, there are very important uh, papers that come out in the last years showing uh, how Many of these uh, treatments are absolutely not useful, not, not well done. That means economically, of course, there's a, a huge damage because you use, you know, maybe a uh, source for, uh, for something, but you can use for something else. And secondly, for the patients, because uh, you are in this field, so you are in this field, so you know that the, for the patients, all these treatments are very aggressive. So no. our strategy was, is uh, exactly this, uh, try to, um, to, secondly, to, to have uh, exactly for that specific patients, uh, the score of aggressiveness and uh, help the oncologist to choose the right treatment for that patients. Okay, so um, can we just go to the, the technique one, the, the one about, um, the one that had the circles with the RNA and all that? Mm -hmm. So, the, yes, I'm, I'm back, sorry. Okay, this one. So the idea is that uh, we, it's, not, it's a combination, so it's a multi-layer, okay? So where we combine the information about the genomics and the transcriptome, so the environment, so the yeah. epigenetics. I can be more technical in this case, because usually I try I have to avoid the technicality. Yeah, yeah. No, no, so this is a... Uh, this is, I was going to say actually, again, to everybody that's watching this, this is a very, very, very good example of how to pitch, uh, prepare your pitch to, to like what you think you're going to be pitching to. So obviously you had no idea that you be a doctor, so you made it very, very simple and very easy to understand. And that's great. Yeah. Thank Almost you. <laughs> I try at least. So the transcriptome is yeah. actually, you know, this is the core, this is very powerful. And this powerful, of course, because uh, take care of uh, not only of our genome, that is, of course, is part of the story, it's only part of the story, but yeah. also the, the environment. And the score that what we got, what we are able to get with this uh, tool is a score of aggressiveness. So it means... Uh, yeah, so, uh, sorry, so, so you, can do, you can do grade and stage, are you saying? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it's a, a score of um, uh, probability that that specific patients with that specific characteristics uh, um, give rise to aggressive tumors, so maybe a metastasis, anyway aggressive or not aggressive. If it's not aggressive, mm -hmm. maybe the oncologist can choose a different strategies. Mm -hmm. And how far are you along with um, clinical trials and FDA approval and all of that? Allora, so it's, we are very far, so it means uh, we already um, validated this so because uh, we are a medical device, uh, number two in, uh, in Europe, so we are now doing the certification to, to sell this, uh, this tool uh, in, uh, uh, at least in Europe, and then we work on, uh, uh, on US, that was our idea at the beginning before COVID-19. Uh, and uh, because now we'll see. Um, so we are quite far. So we are ready to sell this platform. It's already validated. Uh, it's done. This is ready. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And um, can you do this just like what kind of a sample do you need for the, for the biopsy? Do you need to have like, yeah, a... Yeah, I need a biopsy. So I need a, a biopsy, a specimen of biopsy. very small because you know very well that yeah. those 
to do these kind of um, you know uh, experiments is very a little bit uh, um, I need a biopsy it uh, should be frozen I mean uh, many people ask me no <coughs> can you use uh, a paraffin no at the moment is not uh, you know certificated uh, is not um, scientifically sound so the people don't use that there are many troubles so frozen <coughs> sample frozen sample for this but not for COVID for COVID for uh, the, the platform that we developed in this uh, month for COVID no we need just a blood sample we are now right. sending yeah. send the paper on a very high journal. Yeah. So yeah, the next question I was going to ask was like, do you need to? Is it is it necessary for this to be in situ, or can you do it with ex situ? Can you do like cytology, or does it have to be an in situ biopsy? In situ biopsy is fine. Uh, yeah. is, yeah. How? Sorry. And how? Uh, like, what is the minimum size of the biopsy that you can do? Very small. I mean, uh, for this kind of uh, analysis, you need. Uh, even less than what you use usually for uh, uh, histo histologies or uh, regular. It's very, very small. It's up to the oncologist, of course, mm -hmm. of the histologist, because it uh, depends on uh, how big, you know, I am pathologist, so how big is the, the lesions? But it's very, yeah. very small. We did experiments with uh, very, very small pieces. Right. So left okay. over. But you, do, you, do, you do you require within the biopsy to um, keep the... I forgot what it's called, the basal layer. Is that required in your biopsy? No, I don't care in this case. No, it's okay. not important. It's not, I don't care. Okay, sorry, I'm asking you so quickly because I've got so many questions on this. And also, um, last question. Um, have you done a, has there been a comparison done in terms of efficacy of this to existing methods? Like, what is the comparison? So uh, we recommend, so the, the, the businesses, also our strategy is uh, we recommend a way to preserve uh, these samples. So to preserve in a such way, because we know that uh, is the right one and you don't lose information. But then what is required for um, all the other procedures that is also in the patent uh, um, is a standard procedures with the high, high quality. So we put some uh, uh, you know, some specific point that should be like that because what we plan to do is just the analysis. We don't plan to analyze the samples. There are services that are very, very good. It's not our job. We just uh, receive, uh, you know, the, um, this Excel with all the information and we analyze it. So in this okay. case, uh, it's very well detailed anyway because we study all the procedures very well. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. Thank I. You excited and asked too many questions so we've gone over time but we okay. have to <laughs> we have to catch up but thank you very Good. much and, thank uh, you so we'll, much okay uh so last one now is luca i think is that right oh so we're done with all our sessions already uh luca was okay. on the same team no together with katarina yeah oh okay all right and somebody asked um in the uh, sorry it's, it's, it's kind of difficult for me to read the chat questions and like i can't reply to them whilst yep. i'm listening so, so i've collated them already and i'll i'll come and them um, Filippo asked earlier on, you know, how many spots are available for the next cohort out of our expected applications? Um, and do we have a criteria scorecard for evaluations? Yes, so, yeah, it's a secret scorecard, of course, but we definitely do have some sort of a, a rubric to kind of look at it. Um, and then we have our investment panel to then chime in on that before we then move the company into a due diligence phase. After I just pitch. want to add to, to the people that pitched as well, because I think, um, you know, doing what you guys did today in four minutes is extremely difficult. I really feel, really feel for, for, for you guys doing this. It's very, very hard to do this. And actually, normally, um, when we do it our way, we don't do it like this. We do um, five minutes to pitch and then 15 minutes of question and answer. And then you get a break and then you get a second opportunity to do it to, to two different people. For us, that's way more work. We're doubling our workload, but we do that for the benefit of the founders because we want it to be as founder friendly as possible. And we know, we know that it's very, very nerve wracking to do this. So we want people to have a second opportunity just in case they have a technical problem or I don't know, they just forget or you know, they're very, very nervous or whatever. And we've had specific examples where that's happened, where somebody, for example, put the wrong number of zeros on a graph and we said to them, hey, is that the right number? They were very, very embarrassed. And we just said, it's fine, just correct it before the next room. The two rooms don't talk to each other until the very end. And actually, even within the rooms, we don't talk to each other. We fill out the forms independently and at the end, we look at all the forms. So you get like a lot more time and a lot more attention to really show your best side when you do the pictures properly with us. 
and, and just to add on on to that, you know, uh, just how many spots are available <clears> for the next cohort? So we we invest in about eight to twelve companies for each cohort. So it yes. would be really dependent. Uh, it's it's a very competitive um, selection process, of course. Yeah. Okay, we um, do next question. Cohorts. And we normally do um, two cohorts um, per, not exactly a year, per like a year and two months or something, but we do eight to 12, two cohorts per year. Okay, uh, next question was just from, from Vincent. I think that has been addressed already. Is there a cue for presenting our pitch? Um, it's actually just a pre-selected panel for the time being, but feel free to put in your application and then we can go through it and, and provide feedback for you from our website as well. Okay, uh, for Maurizio, you know, he missed the beginning of the presentation and asked, is Betatron injecting 500K into the companies against equity? Uh, yes, we do take um, some equity. We invest typically in, in a structure similar to like a safe note over there for future equity. And because we are a VC, first and foremost, you know, the valuation or the equity take depends on stage of the company and negotiations as well. Okay, hope that um, I just want to say hello to Felipe. Hi, Felipe from Hexagro. <laughs> I remember you from last time when, when you were pitching in the um, Italian Chamber of Commerce. Nice to hear from you again. Um, and uh, in answer to your Q&A, yeah, like Basetron can help with all of the above. So which is like, in, like commercialization and industrialization. In terms of do you need to have a company in Hong Kong or can you keep the holding company in Italy? Yeah, you can keep the holding company in Italy. The only thing that we don't really like is when people have the main com if they have like an operational company but no holding company and the country that the operational company is is in is a country that has like, like some kind of capital controls on it then that's that's kind of a barrier to us then then what would have need to happen is you'd have to create a holding company in a country which doesn't have any um capital controls but having a company in um italy is fine what i would say to all of you though is that uh, it's extremely easy to set up a company in Hong Kong and you should just do it because, um, oh, <laughs> yeah, thank you, welcome. Um, <laughs> and then um, uh, because it's very cheap and easy to, to set, set up a company and if you have one set up, then you qualify for lots of additional uh, governmental help. So I would suggest anyone who is trying to come here to do that, not only in Hong Kong, but um, also there's like specific things that, Hong Kong based companies can get in Shanghai, which is a, a subdivision of Shenzhen. So there's really no downside to opening one up and it's very, very cheap and easy to do. But no, we don't have any restrictions. That was a super long answer, sorry, but nice to see you, Felipe. Long time no see. <laughs> uh, we've got another question from Ness who asks, you know, which are the sectors that Betatron pays more attention to? Um, so we are a um, agnostic sector agnostic uh, VC, although we do like tend to look into companies that have a bit more of a B2B focus in that sense. And traditionally things that, you know, we can assist a bit more from a Hong Kong perspective that they're strong in. Things like supply chain management, logistics, prop tech, <coughs> fintech. Um, that's just a general idea because we want to play on our strengths as well for this. I just want to clarify for the question from Inez DiFranco about what are the sectors which Basetron pays more attention. You meant what are the industrial sectors, right? Like not what do we look at in terms of your company? And then, yeah, okay, good. Yeah, yeah. So he, I, Aiden answered it. Okay. Got it. And then uh, Francesco asked, when does the program start? So it's slated to start um, end June, early July. Um, this program will be completely remote because of COVID, of the COVID situation. Um, and you know, it will be a four month program from that point onwards. Okay. Um, now we're another question from Federico is what is the minimum maturity level for a startup to be accelerated by Betatron? Um, so we don't have a hard and fast rule over there, but a general guideline, which Michael has shared earlier on is, you know, have an MVP uh, done already or have at least, you know, one or two initial traction customers so that we can really focus on scaling up uh, the company over there. There are instances whereby, you know, it could be um, great defensible tech that we could get in uh, on an earlier perspective. Um, but also on a later stage as well, if you're looking to come to Asia on a bridge. Okay. Just to follow up on the minimum maturity level thing. So it really does depend on the company, right? So in general, you know, we 
are an, we, we are accelerator program is an accelerator, not an incubator. So it's not idea phase. We expect an MVP. We expect you to have some kind of traction, customers, that kind of thing. However, there have been some companies that we've invested in earlier than that, but they were very kind of outstanding in terms of <clears throat> there were extremely technical products that very few people could replicate and therefore they had very high defensibility. So usually that doesn't happen. Um, okay. So Aiden, Karen? Yep. Um, let's see if there are any more questions. I think I should have addressed them. Uh, do you consider application of business plan before proof of concept stage? Does that mean you're beyond like an ideation? Like ideation, stage? yeah. So I, I think we just sort of addressed that in the question already. Better to have a proof of concept. Um, it increases the application chances over there. Um, but like we said, we're happy to take a look, especially if you know there is um, really incredible company ideation patents in place um, to for for the for the business. Yeah. Also, you know, like if you're a very very technical founder and you're doing something which like not many people can do, or you know a tiny amount of people can do, then you have way more leverage. Uh, but yeah, in general, we kind of want things that have been, there's been a somewhat an attempt to validate it because we have to deleverage our risk. Yeah. So, so for the four startups that we're pitching today, I hope that gives people an overall idea because there were some who are also in the very early stages. There were some who have gained some traction as well. So that should give people um, a range on how to look at and how we evaluate um, some of these companies. Okay. And those, those of you that weren't able to, you know, be selected for this thing, then <clears throat> hopefully this has given you a bit of insight into what we do. Um, <clears throat> you can still apply uh, for us. And then, as I mentioned, uh, if you get through to pitches, you actually get way more opportunity to, you know, present your best, uh, your best side. Yeah. So uh, just, just to wrap this up, I don't think there are any more questions. Um, so feel free to put in an application onto the Betatron page if you know you'd like us to take a look at your pitch. Um, and even if it is still a bit too early, we're happy to be in touch for you with you for our next cohorts. Um, like you said, we're we're really a network of networks in that sense. And mm -hmm. when you're yeah. putting in that application, uh, please when asked where do you hear about Betatron, put in Invest Italy Hong Kong. Uh, sorry, Invest Hong Kong Italy, and then we will be able to. Uh, well, we are investing in the Italian companies going to Hong Kong. So <laughs> um, then we'll be able to fast track you through the process because, you know, the early applications, as we've mentioned, has closed. We're going through a number of applications, but we want to put some priority on uh, for the people who have taken their time out to attend today's session. In channel okay, so thank you very much. And uh, back to you. Well, um, I think we can close it here, right? If there's no more questions, I think we've received so many. And I wish to thank you, Michael. Thank you, Aiden. It's very, 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 very interesting webinar. I'm sure that uh, this is very valuable for all our um, Italian startups. Uh, and uh, I would just like to remind everybody that next Wednesday, there will be another important issue, another guest, another um, important player in the Hong Kong startup ecosystem uh, called Brink. And uh, please don't miss also our next uh, next uh, meeting, our next appointment. And um, I will leave it here. Thank you very much. The recording and the and the presentations will be available for everybody. Um, stay in touch and see you next Wednesday. Thank you everybody for participating. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. bye, -bye.